good singing. Let's get our Bibles open to the book of Nehemiah. Nehemiah chapter number four. If you open up your Bible right directly in the center, you'll find the book of Psalms. Just back up a little bit you'll, through Job, Esther, and then there's Nehemiah. So. Nehemiah chapter 4, and we're going to look at a few verses here, verses 1 through 6. That's Nehemiah with an N. Nehemiah chapter 4, verses 1 through 6. And uh, if you're there and you're able, let's stand in respect for the reading of God's word. Nehemiah chapter 4. If you can't find it, uh, just be a good listener. I'm sure you'll get it the message. Nehemiah 4, and I want you to join with me on verse 6, and I'll start reading verse 1. But it came to pass that when Sam Ballot heard that we builded the wall, he was wroth and took great indignation and mocked the Jews. And he spake before his brethren in the army of Samaria and said, What do these feeble Jews? Will they fortify themselves? Will they sacrifice? Will they make an end in a day? Will they revive the stones out of the heaps of the rubbish which are burned? Now Tobiah the Ammonite was by him, and he said, Even that which they build, if a fox go up, he shall even break down their stone wall. Hear, O our God, for we are despised, and turn their reproach upon their own head, and give them a, for a prey in the land of captivity. And cover not their iniquity, and let not their sin be blotted out from before thee, for they have provoked thee to anger before the builders. Verse 6 together. So built we the wall, and all the wall was joined together unto the half thereof, for the people had a mind to work. And I want to draw your attention to that last phrase there, the people had a mind to work. And I want to now go to chapter 6, turn the page there, and we're going to read verse 15. Verse 15 of chapter 6 and let's read that together so the so wall was finished, finished in the 20th and 5th day, fifth day of the month Elul in 50 and 2 days. days wow 50 and 2 days so you got to think about this wall that encompassed the temple and the main part of the city at this particular time uh, this is a fantastic feat. I don't know that even today with all the technology and the machinery that we have, if we could build the wall that Nehemiah and his band of people built in 52 days. That's unbelievable. And uh, they did it, and I believe the secret to their success was in verse number 6 of chapter 4. The people had a mind to work. They had a mind to work. And I want to talk to you this morning about what's on your mind. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this day. Thank you for the opportunity to be in church. I know that uh, there's a lot of direction in the room this morning. Uh, some are young, some are old, some are uh, going one direction and some another. But Lord, help us to be Christ-minded this morning for your sake and for your glory. We ask this in Jesus' precious name. Amen. You can be seated. <clears throat> So we get to this story here about Nehemiah. Now I'm going to do a little bit of a, a review for you because it's important. In, what, when, uh, in 586 BC, the king of Babylon, Nebuchadnezzar, destroyed, camped around about the city of Jerusalem for two years. He literally starved them out. And uh, the Bible, there's a book in the Bible called Lamentations. The word Lamentations is where we get our word for lament. We, when you lament something, you're sad about it, right? 
And this is Israel's lamentations. It is the sadness, saddest time of their history at the time that Jeremiah wrote it. The people were so starving, so hungry, they ate their own children. Gold and silver was no longer worth anything. The Bible says in Jeremiah and Lamentations that they cast their silver and gold in the streets. It couldn't buy them anything because when there's no food and you're starved out, uh, they ended up feasting on dung hills. And I won't get into too much detail about what that is, but you can only put your mind there and imagine how bad things got for the nation of Israel at this particular time. Finally, when Nebuchadnezzar comes, he comes in and he burns the city up. He burns the gates of the city. He pillages the, uh, the wall and just makes it a big burning rub heap of rubble. No longer will Israel be a force to be reckoned with against the mighty uh, king of Babylon or Assyria or Egypt anymore. Now Israel will be off the map, off the charts for over a hundred years. They will go into enslavement. We pick up in Nehemiah and about a hundred years later, 400 uh, BC, Nehemiah, 400 something BC, Nehemiah is serving under Artaxerxes, another king in Babylon. And Artaxerxes sends him uh, and allows Nehemiah, he says, Nehemiah, what's, so, what's up with you? He's, he was a cupbearer for the king. And he's like, what's wrong with you? I know you're, I noticed your countenance is sad. And he's like, uh, my, pe my people are destroyed. My city's destroyed. You know, I just want to be a part of the homeland. And Artaxerxes II allowed Nehemiah to go back to his hometown under the then ruling emperor of the world. You got to think like in these days, it was like if you were the emperor of Babylon or the king of Babylon, you were like, the uh, pharaoh of Egypt in his day back in the Old Testament, you were like the uh, the emperor of Rome in, it, in its day. You literally were the ru world ruler. And so this king, Artaxerxes, gives Nehemiah permission to go back and rebuild the walls, rebuild a city, and establish a homeland for the people of Israel. It was a, and Cyrus issued the decree after Artaxerxes, and it became like this an amazing event in Israel's history, they were now allowed to go back to their, their homeland again. There were some little uh, snakes in the grass along the way, Sam Ballot and Tobiah, and they were trying to uh, talk down and belittle the men of God as they were trying to build the wall. And I'll tell you this, anybody that ever gets in the Christian ranks and tries to build a home for the Lord, tries to build a church for the Lord, tries to build a life for the Lord. You're going to have your little crooks, your little your little Sam Ballots and Tobias talking them down. Oh, that guy don't know what he's talking about. Oh, yeah, he's just a hothead. Oh, yeah, she don't look at her. She thinks she's better than everybody else. Those little Sam Ballots and Tobias are everywhere. Don't be alarmed by it when you hear or see one of them. They're, the whole world is full of them, but you just do what Nehemiah did. You just keep building the wall. And the Bible says that uh, they band, they divided up into two groups. They had have a night group and a day group. They would have a uh, two two types of pieces of it of uh, of uh, uh, things that they would carry with them. One of them was a sword by day uh, and a hammer by night, or vice versa. So they had they were ready if. The enemy was going to attack, they were ready to defend, but at the same time, if the enemy was not attacking, they were swinging the hammer and getting the wall built and putting up the gates, and a, a miracle happens. Now, you got to think, this wall is huge. If you go to Israel today, you can kind of get an idea. I mean, we after Nehemiah's temple, there was one that was built to fix uh, a lot of the, uh, some of the details of Nehemiah's and and restructure the temple and restructure the wall. And Herod, this temple lasted all the way to the time of Christ. And it wasn't until Herod the Great that uh, Herod would begin to rebuild that old wall. And you can go to Israel today and see the division between uh, Nehemiah's wall and Herod's wall in the actual city limits. And so there's not much left of that wall because Titus in 70 AD destroyed the city of Jerusalem and sacked the city. Again, it wasn't a, an encampment where he starved them out. He actually invaded the city and just wiped everybody out. Over a million Jews died that, that time. 
But nevertheless, there is some archaeological remnants there of this wall, and it's fantastic, large amounts of it. And it is an uh, unbelievable story when you see miles, miles and miles and miles of wall in Jerusalem were built without bobcats, without cranes, without diesels, without all these things that we could use today in our uh, culture, in our era. And in 52 days, they built that stinking wall, and it was a fantastic, beautiful masterpiece. They overcame the, uh, the Sanballat and Tobias. They overcame the obstacle of the wall itself, and they had a good spirit. The ladies probably were cooking by day and cooking by night and changing out their good old-fashioned husband socks. It was a day where uh, everybody knew their part. And, uh, and these guys rolled up their sleeves and they got the stinking job done and did a work that lasted for hundreds, almost half a century. It's amazing, hundreds of years. I don't know about you, but you know, I think this is an amazing story. It's one that everybody in the world needs to learn about because you know what? Uh, that's what got the job done. And it took more than one person you know, everybody wants to just have one person do everything in this world. And, you know, when we got to realize that all of us are part of a unit, you know, we're part of a unit. And uh, whether you're a family, that's a family unit. Whether you're in a classroom, that's a classroom unit. If you're on a football team, that's a unit. If you're in a church, that's a unit. And, you know, uh, you got to do your part and everybody else has to do their part. And before long, this mind to work presents itself to the to the to the unit and everybody's on board with it. And lo and behold, great things are happening. Uh, fantastic things are accomplished, just like this wall that was built and lasted for 400 years. In verse uh, 9 through 13, he set up a watch. In verse 14, he, they, he told them to take courage. In verse 15, he said to keep working. In verse 17, he said to multitask. They which built the wall bear burdens, which those that had laid it, and every one with his own hands wrought in the work, with the other hand held a weapon. Like I said, a sword in one hand and a hammer in the other. I don't know where you are in the spectrum of life that you're in, but you know, you may have a vision, you may have a plan in your life, but you can't knock out the work that God wants you to do at the same time. Nobody gets to do their own thing in life. And if you do, you, you can. I'm not going to say you can't do what you want to do, but if you decide to be your own boss in this world, don't be surprised when you lose. Don't be surprised when you fall flat on your face. You know, nobody has unlimited freedom like that. You know, freedom is like the enemy of life. It really is. We praise it on one end of the spectrum, but then it curses us on the other end. Because if you're too free with your money, you may not have enough money to pay your bills. If you're too free with loose living, you might find yourself with a sexually transmitted disease. If you're too free with the way you want to live, don't be surprised if you end up behind bars someday because you thought you were free to just do whatever you want, take whatever you want, live any way you want, and not pay the piper on the other end. My friend, listen to me. We got to balance out freedom in life with discipline, with principle, with the law of God. You nobody gets to do it without biting the bullet. I'm just telling you. I'm, not, I'm so glad I can look back over 25 years of being a Christian. 28 years. I am getting old. 28 years of being a Christian. I'm glad I can't look, I can look back on my life and say, you know what? I haven't even wasted one weekend. I remember before I was saved, I, I could go back and say, man, I wish I wouldn't have took that trip. I wish I wouldn't have done that. I wish I wouldn't have took that job and wasted six months of my life. I wish I wouldn't have dated that person and wasted those months. You know, if you're a godly person, if you're loving the Lord, if you're following God in your life, hey, let me tell you something. There's no more wasted days, wasted life, wasted living. Because you know what? You're not doing what you want anymore. You're doing what God wants. 
You know, I go when God tells me I can go. And until then, I don't plan on it. I don't go. There's many times I can do a lot of things. I can buy a lot of things, just like a lot of other people do. But I do it when it's God's timing and on God's turf. Because I don't want to get burned like I have been in my past, way back yonder. Hey, I don't know about you, but we got a group of people these days that think they can live the Christian life on one end and do whatever the heck they want on the other. Hey, let me tell you something. The wall will never get built by that group of people. The family will never get built by that group of people. The life will never get built by that group of people. Those people despise the word of God, do their own thing. And let me tell you what Sam Ballant and Tobiah really were. They were Samaritans. And you know what a Samaritan was? He was an Israelite. He was an Israelite that split up between the northern and the southern kingdom. But most of those people that ain't building the wall would never know that because they don't even read the sacred Bible to know the history of Samaria and the Samaritans and where it all came from. This Jewish band right here, the little critics, Sam out and Tobiah. The people that lived it their way, spin it their way, done it their way. Let me tell you something. Their way were nothing but a burden to the true people of God. And the sooner they got out of their way, the better off everybody was. But until then, Sam Ballot and or Nehemiah just said, manned up every time they blew their little smoke. Nehemiah said, come on, any day you want, I got, my, I got my hammer over here. But any way day you want, I got my sword in the other hand. You just put up and shut up, you loud mouth. I've been dealing with the critics for years. They bash me, they talk behind my back. They belittled me. They act like, look, Danny don't know what the heck he's doing in life. Let me tell you something. Look where Danny's at now. Look where he's going to be in a few years. I got some big plans on the horizon, folks. And I don't need man's anything. I just need that big G upstairs, the big guy. And if he's in my corner, we can do anything. And if he's in your corner, you can do anything. You don't have to listen to the Sam Ballots and Tobias. They've done nothing. They've, everything they have done, they've done it on their own way, in their own time, on their own will. They're a bunch of losers. Just let them lose and lose and lose. You just wait till it's your turn. And you just wait till God comes through for you. They'll be sitting there on their rump while you're exalted in the end. And you'll be doing A-OK -okay and sitting with God doing the right thing while they sit there in their little pity party wondering what in the heck happened to them. I don't know about you, but God, these group of people, they built the wall. They did a miraculous feat, something that could have took years for the average group of people. Years. Took 52 days. Everybody says, oh, you know what? I'm going to kick the alcohol, and it's going to take me a while. I'm going to go on this six-month detox program. I'm going to join the, the, uh, the rehabilitation center for 30 days first to get it kicked off, and I'll taper myself down and get down to a few beers a day, and then one of these days I'll be down to a, a whatever. Let me tell you something, folks. God has a fast plan in a lot of people's lives. You don't have to have a long, drawn-out six months Another year, two years of living like a fool, wasting your days, wasting your life with the bums in the bar. Let me tell you something. They ain't never going to find nothing but a bum in a bar. <laughs> I'm just going to tell you the truth. Why even, why even, why even second guess such a stupid thing like that? I'm going to go to the bar and look for a man. <laughs> Can you just put stupid across somebody's forehead? Can you just put it stupid? You know, I, I don't know. I mean, uh, don't get mad. I mean, it's, it's just true. Who goes to the bar and looks for a man? Who goes to the bar and looks for a woman? You might go to a bar and look for a whore. You might go to a bar and look for a slut. But you don't go to a bar and look for a man. Man ain't found in the bar. Unless all you think is men are, are, uh, are, are nothing but hormones and muscle. That's stupid. Oh my gosh, I've been plagued with this group of Christians, these groups of Sam Ballots and Tobias in this world. Little old panty wanny people in this life. Can't live a life that's above board. Can't be, I'm so busy, Pastor, I can't build the wall this week or next week. Actually, I got a few years. When I get around to it, I'll offer a little. Uh, 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 do you want me to hand? I, I, I was telling the story about how we uh, spent thousands of dollars and sacrificed and everything, and this able bodied man with a job and his wife had a job and all these great things. I said, yeah, we're gonna volunteer to have a big dinner. We're gonna invite the whole community. A hundred people promised to come. 
I'm going to spend thousands on fireworks. We're going to have this big event. This grown man says, I'll bring a, a can of cranberry sauce. <laughs> I said, man, you're going to bring more than cranberry sauce, buddy, if you're going to be working with me. That ain't a sacrifice. You can go down to the food pantry and get a can of cranberry sauce. Man, we're baking, steaking ribs on the grill. We need charcoal. We need... We're gonna throw a party, man. We're gonna do something great. You got a month to figure it out. And all you can come up with in your foresight for a month of an event that's a month away is a can of stinking cranberry? What the heck is that? Something nobody likes but his fat butt. Pardon my fatness, man. You know what? That sucker came to, came to our event and brought a can of, can of cranberry sauce. You know what I did to him? I started bragging on him in front of his wife about how good of a cook he was. It only was like 95 degrees that day. I bragged and I bragged, oh yeah, I can cook, I can do, I can, man, he was blowing it up. I said, man, you know what I need today? I need a chef. I need somebody to cook these hot dogs and hamburgers and stuff on the grill. Man, for the next two hours, I saw that dude pour down gallons of sweat in the heat. Oh, he's the hero, man, man. You ain't gonna pull one over on me with some cranberry sauce. God bless you. I've hired people at the job. Every time I show up at the job, they're sitting on their big bottoms on the floor. Hey, you know, nothing's ever getting done by you sitting on a stinking floor. I mean, I've done people favors by giving their kids jobs. And you find these big old uh, brewskis sitting on their rears, getting nothing done, paying them big money. I mean, golly, I was so happy recently when one of my uh, workers decided to get a better a, a job. What a better job, what a higher paying job. The dude, he's gonna be quitting in like a week because he's in rush hour traffic both ways. And his job is like 60 miles away and I calculated the gas and everything. And I'm like, this dude's gonna be coming home with like 150, 200 bucks a week after the gas and everything. All because he took a job out in O'Fallon, Missouri. What a, what an idiot. Can anybody put stupid across that guy's forehead? He'll be calling me in this week or next week. I, my job was a block away. He was bringing home five, six hundred bucks a week, and he was able to take off all kinds of days that he wanted. He was doing great. And I was like a couple blocks away from his house. He took a job in O'Fallon, Missouri. <laughs> oh my God. Hey, he's going to be calling me, and you know what he's going to say? Yeah, that job didn't work out, uh, 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 Brother Danny. Everybody calls me brother. Brother Danny, that job didn't work out. I said, yeah, I kind of told you it wasn't going to work out like three times. But that's okay. Because I already found somebody to replace you. And you ain't coming back to work with me. You can go sit on your big caboose somewhere else. You can go sit in the back of the booster chair all you want. You ain't gonna find them. Oh, the, you know, it's another thing too. People that are about 150, 200 pounds overweight, they get to working with me, they start losing like five, 10 pounds every single week. It's amazing how it works when you work. You know, work does stuff to you. It gives you a good constructive mind. It allows you to lose a little bit of extra pounds that you didn't want. The dude was doing great. I mean, golly, I had him on a thing where he was, I saw him when he first started with me like a month and a half before to where he was when he ended. I'm like, man, this dude probably lost 15 or 20 pounds. He don't even realize it. Now he's gonna go sit at a, at a job, sit on his rump. He's gonna drive an hour there, drive an hour back. He's gonna sit on his rump all day long and just get, get all that weight back. You know, that's the last thing somebody in their 30s needs is to be dealing with their physical and their spiritual and their mental. It's just horrible. You know, we, we, we compound our own problems in our life because we're not thinking right. Life is a state of mind. Life is a state of mind. And if you don't have a mind to work, if you're a student, you ought to have a mind to study. If you are a uh, family man, you ought to have a family type mind. I'm sorry, I don't go out with the guys for two or three days. I got a wife and kids and a home and everything else. You know, everybody talks about their, their little escapes and their little excursions in life, and that God bless them, and I'm for getting out every once in a while. There's nothing wrong with that at all. But good night. Some people are doing it every single week. I know grown people, grown adults, can't just sit there and focus on what life's all about. Got to run to this show and that playground and this skate park and that uh, 
Six Flags and memberships here and memberships there. Life's just some big uh, carnal party where you just get to have fun all your day. You know, fun ruins people. When, when's everybody going to learn that? Fun ruins them. You know, nobody, nobody gets to have fun all their life because, like, fun is not really all that fun. You know what I'm saying? If it gets you in trouble, you know, you can go out and have a whole bunch of fun. But what is fun going to do when, when your pocket is empty and you can't pay your bills? What is fun going to do when you tally up the numbers, my friend? Tally up the numbers. And you find out that it, 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 it adds up to like many tens of thousands of dollars every year. Many, and maybe not tens, but maybe thousands. Oh yeah, wasted life, wasted money. And it's too easy to do that, especially when it ain't theirs. A lot of it. Hey, I don't know about you, but you know what I do with my boys? I get compliments all the time about it. There ain't nothing good about my kids other than Jesus Christ. There ain't nothing good about me. But I'll tell you one thing. I work them. I work them. They ain't got time to sit at home and play games. They ain't got time to sit at home. And by the way, uh, how's that pocketbook looking, Danny? You getting ready to go to college pretty soon? You getting ready? Danny's already owns his own truck. He's got 90,000 miles on it. He's been working for years. He's got his own bank account, Shelby. He's got a good size bank accounts. A lot of times I'll look at my wife's phone. She's got all their bank accounts on her phone. And every time I'm looking at the bank and her phone, I'm like, these little rascals got more money than I do. <laughs> I'm like, man, alive, I need to make a transfer out of their account. But you know what? You teach your kids to work. You teach them to make some money. You teach them to put the money in their bank account. You teach them to know, let them have some money sometimes. Let them have their money. A lot of times I'll let them have their money. And you know what they do? They'll go to Quick Trip and they'll spend it. And Jackson's like, I had 50 bucks and now I'm down to like 25. And I've only been to Quick Trip twice. What's he learning? He's learning what spends and how much it is. He's learning everything. You see, most kids have zero knowledge of that. By the time they get out of high school, they're right off into college and they wonder why they can't keep their money in their pockets. They wonder where it's all going because we don't teach them anything. Oh, we teach them sex education. We teach them all the stupid stuff that the world has to offer. Dumb old history from slanted views. You know, every, you know, every country in this world, if you ever talk to the Bosnians about their history, it's different than the way we propagate it here. If you ever talk to uh, any country about their history, they will not tolerate the way we present it here because they're from there. And if you go to the South, their history is different than the North. If you go to Canada, their history is different. You know, everybody's different, but yet we just, history, science, all this stuff. You know, why don't you teach people to work? Why don't you teach them to get their butts out of bed and go to work? Why don't you start by teaching them and making them, you ain't getting out of that. My mom used to tell us, you ain't getting out of that room till your, till your room's clean. Man, you you never seen so much stuff pile up under the bed of our house, of our room, so quick. That room, that room was spotless, man. Everything's under the bed, and uh, you and then you just make your bed. And, hey, that is better than not doing it that way. Now nah, we did learn to clean our rooms too. But you know what, my mom also made us do? We'd walk down two city blocks with bags and carts of laundry. She had a laundry cart. In Jacksonville Beach, Florida, we go, we get a uh, 7-Up Big Gulp. When I first went to 7-Up, this is how old I was, they had nothing but a Big Gulp. You mean 7-Eleven. 7-Eleven, I'm sorry. And then after seven, after the Big Gulp, we were excited one day. We showed up to 7-Eleven, they had a new cup. It's called the Super Gulp. Super Big Gulp. And man, we can do our laundry, we get to sip on a Super Big Gulp. We'd all share one and Mom would have hers. And then lo and behold... 7-Eleven got wise to the world's bellies and came out with the glorified double gulp. <laughs> Amen. Man, I was double gulping it up for a year or two. And back then, 7-Elevens were the popular thing everywhere. And then uh, they, they lost their trend somewhere in the 90s, I think, and everybody passed them up. And you'll still see them out there, but I just want you to know, uh, I don't even know what I want you to know. Huh? Oh yeah, laundry, thank you, what are wives for? And, uh, but you know what? I was a little kid, six, seven, eight, and nine, and my mom taught us how to sort our laundry out. We knew that the whites went in this one, 
The colors went in this one and the darks went in that one. Remember that? How many of you remember that? Did your parents ever do that? You know, this day and age that we live in, I'm just going to tell on my kids and my generation. This laundry detergent says you don't even have to do that anymore. You can just throw it all in there. You know, I wish we could go back in time and do it the, that way because there was something about that step in the process. Because if you knew how to sort your clothes, you knew kind of what landed where. And not only that, you learned how to fold your own stinking clothes. You know, we got a generation today, they don't wash their own clothes. They don't sort their own clothes. They don't turn their clothes. Oh yeah, my mom made us turn our clothes inside out. Right. Everybody remember that one? Turn your clothes inside, inside out right. And uh, you know, it's a statement you barely ever hear these days because everybody just throws them in whether they're inside out wrong or inside out right. Hey, you get to do it any way you want. You don't even have to put them away. Now, when I had five kids, I got tired of the battle. I said, babe, let's just sort the clothes after we wash everything between Jackson, Danny, Shelby, Davis, Danielle, Krista, and myself. Let's just sort everybody else's stuff up in our piles. And don't worry about folding them anymore. And the reason is, is because the moment they go into their drawers, they just mess everything up anyway. And all that folded clothes is gone. not folded anymore. You know, nobody, no, no kid, Austin's age back there, nicely and politely lifts up one folded t-shirt. Where's that one with the, with the special link? There it is. Uh-oh, let me stick my hand under here nice and neat and get the elevator lift and slide this one out so I don't damage these folded clothes right here and gently set them back down and then push the door. Every kid walks in there, I'm late for school, I gotta catch the bus, where's that shirt? There it is, God bless America. You know, that's how we are. I said, don't fold the clothes anymore. Just throw them in their drawers, let them sort through their crud and figure it out. But you know what, you gotta have a mind to work a mind to work. These people these days, they don't have a mind to do anything but play. One game after another. One song after another. I, we go days without listening to songs. Days. I took the TV a couple weeks back and threw it over the hill. It's busted in a whole bunch of pieces down at the bottom of the hill. Big 60 inch flat panel screen. I just walked it out the back door, saw the great big giant cliff and said, say la vie, baby, I'll see you later. The boys were like, why can't you just give it away? Or somebody may say, why don't you just sell it on Marketplace? You might even get a couple hundred bucks out of it. Yeah, I'll get one later. A couple, Davis, the little Davis, five years old. He said, Daddy, are we ever going to get another TV? I said, we might later. You know, we haven't really missed it much at all. You don't know. You, you know, it takes up your time. It will waste your life. Oh, my goodness. Be careful what you bring in. Tell you, these guys had a mind to work. They were more interested in getting on that wall, swinging their hammer, protecting their home, that's reestablishing, rebuilding their country, than they were doing their own thing, enjoying their own life. Hey, I don't know about you. Uh, I want us to have a mind to work, you know, a mind to work. Let me go on. I want to talk to you about this state of mind thing. Go to Philippians chapter number three. Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians. It's in the New Testament. Philippians chapter 3. And notice what Paul says. He's talking about the high calling of God. Verse 17, chapter 3. Right after Genesis, like a whole long way after Genesis. <laughs> if you have my Bible, it's on page 1227. So it's towards the end. But if you don't, if you can't find it, don't worry, I'm gonna speak it and you can just hear it and, and see what you can come up with. Listen to this, verse 17. Brethren, be followers together of me and mark them which walk so as ye have us for an example. He says, listen to what Paul tells the, the people here in Philippi, the church at Philippi. He says, when you find somebody like me, mark that person. Mark them. 
You know, he, he told people to mark the good, and he also on another end of the spectrum said to mark those which are bad, so you don't hang around. You know what that means? Judge them. It means judge them. It means follow the leaders and stick with them and avoid the bad ones because they may bring you down. But notice what he says. He said, mark them. And then he says this. For many. See, so once you follow, find somebody like me, stick with them, he says. But then when he says this, for many walk of whom I have told you often. And now tell you even weeping that they are the enemies of the cross of Christ. Listen to this. Whose end is destruction, whose God is their belly, and whose glory is in their shame. And then lastly, I like this one, who mind earthly things. You know this earthly minded group of people in this world? You know, the people that are the enemies of the cross of Christ. Paul just gave an example of what kind of people they're like right there. And he says, mark those because guess what? They mind earthly things. They're always thinking about the world and what goes on in the earth and how they can satisfy themselves and be at peace and harmony in, in their little utopian state. They could care less about the gospel. They could care less that the world's dying and going to hell. They could care less about the guy next door that needs a, a helping hand. They could care less about their own family. They can care less about their own spouses, some of them. They could care less about anything because all they're concerned about is their own earthly good, their own mindedness on earthly things. Hey, you know what uh, my Bible tells me? Uh, Jesus said, take no thought for your life, what shall be on the morrow? He's like, uh, you know, because tomorrow will take care of the things of itself. He's like the, 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 uh, the, the sparrow, uh, God takes care of that. The blade of grass, every blade that ever sprung up, God knows about that. What in the world are you so focused and caring about what you're going to put on, the raiment, what you're going to eat and put in your stomach. He's like, if God could take care of everybody, all the animals in the world, don't you think he could take care of you? Of course he could take care of you. And so why mind the earthly things? Why put so much focus on them? You know, do some good in people's life to get rid of all their earthly things. You know, there was a guy named Leo Tolstoy. He was one of the greatest authors in Russian history back in like the 1918s. Yeah, and uh, he wrote some amazing books. I have read part of a few of them, and I've listened and read some documentaries about the guy. And uh, Tolstoy, uh, he, he was attacked by the Cossacks, the army of uh, Russia at one time. He was disbanded and dehomed and dethroned and all kinds of stuff. He was probably the greatest writer, though, one of the greatest writers to ever live. I mean, the dude was amazing. And, um, but one day, in his millionaire state, he was an old man, he was probably in the 1930s at this time, 1940s, I'm not sure exactly the era of the age, but he was very old, and you know what he decided to do? Every, he had a beautiful home, beautiful piece of property, a large family. He had many, 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 I would say equivalents of millions of dollars in his day. I don't know what that would, you know, in our day be equivalent to millions, but back then I don't know what that would be, especially talking about rubles and stuff like that. But one of the things that Leo Tolstoy did, he did the unthinkable. He packed, this is like an, oh no, I'm sorry, this was like a 19, uh, uh, I don't even know, it's probably pre, pre World War One. He packed up all of his stuff and just left. He got rid of, he, 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 got, he just abandoned everything that he had. Because he, in all of that, he lost his glory. In all of that, he lost his touch with what he was put here to do. He was no longer writing quite like he used to. His passion was gone. It stole his joy of life. And, you know, people wouldn't think that, you know, money can steal your joy. Fun can steal your joy. And your, take away your happiness. Everybody, you know, we got to realize why we're happy. Because people that have all the things that you look for sometimes are the most miserable people in the world. And Leo Tolstoy made the right decision in the end of his life. And he became twice the famous as he ever was. 
when he just packed up his bags and left. He just became a hobo. I don't know about you, but, uh, but you know, he just decided I can't mind earthly things anymore. Are you minding earthly things today? Are you caring about all the things of this earth and not so much the things of God anymore? Look at Philippians chapter number 2. I want you to see that. Just turn the page. Philippians 2. Look at verse 2. Fulfill ye my joy that ye be like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord and one mind. You know, like-mindedness means having the same love. You know, I can't have a wife that loves adventure and, and the mountains and getting away and escaping and money and things and this and that. I got to have a wife that's on board and like-minded with me and loves the same things that I love. And that is the Lord thy God with all that heart, soul, and mind, like we're commanded to do. You know, you ought to know when your life's being drawn away because your passions will change. The things you used to love, you don't love anymore. I've seen parents go, grow cold on their kids. I've seen kids grow cold on their parents. I've walked into homes where the wives don't love their husbands, the husbands don't love their wives, the children don't love their parents, and the parents are so fed up and upset they can't even love their kids anymore. They're actually disgusted about how they've become. I was talking to a guy recently that was just bashing his daughter and telling me all these bad things about how she's this and she's that and what she does. And I mean, it was like very evil stuff. I don't even talk to her anymore. She's so off her rock in life. Oh my gosh, I could just never imagine in a million years having a daughter I can't love. Having a you know, I tell little Danielle, I tell her about once every other day. I'm like, Danielle, when you get older, I got to tell her every other day because if I tell her every day, she remembers from the day before and she don't answer me. But if I tell her every other day, I say, Danielle, when you get older, like when you become a big princess and you're not a little princess anymore, I said, uh, are you going to get married? And she looks at me with her eyes and she goes, uh-huh, uh-huh. And I said, oh, you are? And she's like, yeah. Who are you going to marry? And she's like, you, Dada. <laughs> I said, oh, yeah, you just got me there. Hey, I don't know about you. I love my daughter. I love my boys. Danny went into surgery the other day. We prayed in the kitchen together, put our arms around each other. He was going under the knife. I gave him a big hug, and I kissed him. I gave him a kiss. He's my boy, 16 years old or not. When he's 20 years old, I'll give him a kiss. And when Danielle's 25 and married with kids, if she comes over and smart mouths at her dad's house, I'm gonna spank her. <laughs> I'll just tell you, I'll do that. But, but you know, how can you not, how can you ever grow cold with your family, with the things you love? I'll tell you how. You grow cold with the one that created it all. You grow cold with the one that fashioned it in the womb. You grow cold with the one who wrote about the law of marriage in the home in this book right here. You grow cold with that, you grow cold with everything. There are groups of people, and the reason there's so much evil in the world, right now, those basketball guys that bash that kid's face in on the basketball court, and all he was trying to do was tell his kid friend, his friends didn't mean any harm, don't worry about it. They beat him to a pulp, why? Because they're loveless, they're cold. They're cold to life, and we got a cold group of people in this world that are detached, that are cold. And let me tell you, we got a government that's cold. Cold to our needs, cold to the fact that there's no baby food in the aisles, cold to that we can't afford to fill up our gas tank anymore. Now, I remember back in my, the good old days in the 80s, I remember dad getting up, up to the gas pump and, and he'd just say, uh, son, put in $2, would you? And it wasn't because we didn't, you know, it would have cost $25 to fill the tank probably at that time, but $2 got you about two gallons and a half. You know, that's when you were on tough times back then. Now we're seeing everybody go to the gas pump where it was costing us 50 bucks, 40 bucks to fill our vehicle. Now it's costing 110, 120. 
and we're just like, I can't fill the tank anymore. I'm just going to put a half a tank in there. That's when you're, and you know what we're doing? Because we're so carnal, because we're so pleasure seeking, because we just want to have fun and we live in America and we're spoiled, stinking rotten. We don't see that we're knocking the floor right from out from underneath our feet every time we get in our boats, every time we drive to the lake, every time we go to the shopping store, every time we go out to eat, every time we have to have the, the, the best of the best, every time we have to act like, oh, don't interrupt my status quo of having fun and being an adventurous, I will overcome everything when the, when the, when the prices are going up and the income ain't going nowhere but down. I'm just telling you, you better be careful. You know, you can't live that same, at that same way in this economy because in a few months, folks, I'm just telling you as a church, in a few months, you will feel the effects. You, nobody has enough savings put away. If, if you're living week to week or month to month, nobody has enough. I'm just telling you, if, if, if you have 100, 200, 300 thousand dollars in the bank, that's nothing. That's nothing. That's nothing in this world. I blow through thousands of dollars every week like it's nothing. And I'm not talking about in my family. I'm talking about with my job. I have a big job. And a lot of money goes through my hands. But I'm just telling you, be careful. I'm at the lumber yard every day. I'm at Home Depot every day. Buy materials. I see the prices going up. A piece of plywood that was 20 bucks five months ago is 60 bucks now. Two by fours that were $1.69 for years are eight and nine dollars a piece now so just be careful about what we're doing you got to have a mind to save you got to have a mind to conserve you have to have a mind to be able to look in the future and say hey i got to be ready for sam ballant to buy it i got to be ready for the hard time you know these two ladies on the second row you know what they lived through the great depression it lasted about 10 years People in the city, everybody in the city had, had chickens and sold their eggs. It was horrible. I've been, my, ever since my wife got on the keto diet, I've been chickened out, man. I can't handle eggs anymore. I don't know why. I love eggs. I like them boiled. I can still do them boiled, but I'm, I'm serious. I can only handle one egg with sunny side up or anything. Oh, God bless us. I can't stand it. I'll eat a boiled egg, but that's about it. I'm done with it. Now I gotta put some salt and pepper on it or put in some tuna or something. But, I, but I'm just telling you, I'm already cursed for this Great Depression coming around the corner. Hey, we'll survive it. All I'm saying is you gotta think now and be careful now. If you can get a job now, get a job. Get out and work. 15, 16 bucks an hour and live under that budget. You'll do fine. You'll be well. And if you have a mind, you know, you can learn to make do with what you got and, and work with things. Uh, so I want to go on from that one. Go to Acts chapter number 17, and I'm almost done. Acts 17. Acts 17. It's one of my favorite verses in all the Bible. Acts 17 and verse 11. Acts 17. It says in verse 10, the brethren immediately sent away Paul and Silas by night unto Berea, who coming thither went into the synagogue of the Jews. All right, now look at verse 11. Let's read this together. These were more noble than those in Thessalonica in that they received the word with all readiness of mind and searched the scriptures daily, whether those things were so. How did they receive the word? With a readiness of mind. Isn't that something? Have you ever heard your parents say to you, or you did it to yourself, hey, we're going out to eat in a little while. Don't eat now, because you're going to ruin it for yourself when we go to the buffet, right? Have you ever heard that before? Yeah. These people here, they did that with the word of God. They didn't abstain, but when they came, they were ready. Man, they, they were ready to search the scriptures. They were ready to open their Bible. They probably prayed before they got to church. They didn't listen to rock music and the beats and smoke a joy on the way to church and, and, and fly by the seat of their pants and all this jazz. Let me tell you something, man. They wanted, they wanted to receive the word with a readiness of mind. 
You know, it's game time. It's Bible time, baby. Woo! I'm going to be fired up. I'm going to be ready. I've seen people come to martial arts, dragging their feet. Got the Lord. You know what we do to them? All right, we're going to run three or four laps around the track. Let's go. Follow me in. Oh, man, I didn't want to be here. Push-ups, everybody. Down, 10 push-ups. Oh, and then 10 sit-ups. Oh, man, I hate this guy. 10 sit-ups. Oh, my goodness. More laps. High knees. Get those knees up, boys. Come on. Get them up. Yeah, baby. Line up. And they all get up on the line. High plank time! Oh gosh, they can't even afford to think about anything else but the pain and the torture and the suffering. Before I know it, man, they're having fun. They see somebody fall on their face. They start getting excited about martial arts. They get their belt promotions and they start growing. And you know, you gotta get the readiness of mind. You gotta be ready. You gotta be ready. You know how what causes a lot of accidents? People getting in a car and they're not thinking about what the heck they're doing. When you get in a car, get ready to be in a car. Look at your surroundings. Make sure your mirrors are where they need to be. You know, adjust that little button over here. You can adjust this mirror this way. If Krista, she's shorter than me. She adjusts my stinking mirror. She adjusts my rear view mirror. Every time I get in the car, things have changed. Man, you walk out there in life and you're not ready, you're going to get yourself in an accident. It's all because you weren't ready. A readiness of mind to receive the word of God. Hey, you know, uh, sometimes I, when I'm studying, I'll just say, Danielle! Get out of here! Krista! She'll be upstairs. What? Come and get your daughter! Trying to study. And then I'll be, I love you, baby. Go to your mommy. And she's like, no, I don't want to go to mommy. <laughs> well, I'll give you a blankie. I'll give you a blankie. I'll do such, I'll try to bribe her, connive her, lie to her, do whatever I can do to get her out of there. Because sometimes she's so demanding, I can't even study. I can't even receive the word with a readiness of mind. You know, I want God to be able to search me. I want God to be able to teach me. I want God to be able to instruct me because I feel like my job as a dad is so important. I feel like my job as a husband is so important. I can't miss when God decides to speak to me. Does that make sense? And so I don't know about you. Everybody wants to listen to music and have the... And just, Maybe play the Bible with all the real ruckus and the, and the stuff going on in life. Listen, man, this haphazard way of having God in your life is ridiculous. It's never worked. It never does work. It won't work. Throw that junk in the trash, that philosophy in the trash. Show me in the Bible. Yeah, just enjoy the ruckus of life right along with the Bible. It's all good. Yeah, don't work that way. Don't work that way. And I'm almost done. One more. So... Uh, we talked about receiving the word with the readiness of mind. And one last point, and I'm going to get you out of here. Is, uh, Rev, uh, Acts 20, same book, different chapter, a couple chapters away. Acts 20 and verse number 19. I'll start in verse 18. And when they come to him, he said unto them, You know from the first day that I came into Asia, after what manner I've been with you at all seasons, and then look at verse 19. Let's read it together. Serving the Lord with all humility of mind and with many tears and temptations which befell me by the lying in wait of the Jews. So notice this statement. Serving the Lord with all humility of mind. You know, it's just, what is humility of mind? Is it being this little passive individual that can never voice their opinion about God or anything? No, it has nothing to do with that. It doesn't intend on you giving everybody their way and you stepping out of the limelight. This humility of mind signifies that God is running this show, that you, you're not running it. God is. Whether it costs you a relationship with the individual you're trying to serve or not. You know, Christ said, I didn't come to... to to, to, uh, to save the world in a sense of 
you know, family with family, and you know, everybody gets to enjoy this one happy utopia of an environment. He's like, no, I came to set husband and variance with their wives. Children will go against and be, you know, will have diversity with their parents. Things will, the gospel, basically what he's saying there is the gospel will divide. The gospel will separate people. The gospel of Jesus Christ, the love for the Lord, will make or break a relationship. And so this humility of mind, what is it? It's when you decide to say, hey, I am going to be subservient in my service for the Lord to this book right here. That's the humility of mind. You know, it's not peace at all costs. Peace is like one of the worst things you ever could pursue in life. Peace should be secondary. It should be, uh, it should never be the primary focus. Neither should war, by the way. But if you get it, great. If you don't, it is what it is. Because I can't let whether my life is in a hostile situation or like a chaotic situation or a peaceful situation, that's not going to change the way of who I am. I'm going to be what I'm supposed to be regardless of all the stuff that's around me. Does that make sense? I still have to trust and obey for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus. And so this state of mind, you know, it can go a long way. And, and you can travel lightning fast like this group of Jews did in the book of Nehemiah when you're pulling on the same road as other believers are. You know, when you it's easy to be have a happy marriage when you're surrounding yourself with a bunch of other people who have happy marriages who go to church and don't drink and drug and party at night. It's so much easier to really enjoy your life and your marriage when you're not wishy-washy in life. You know, you got to have the mind for it, though. you gotta, you got to sell your life out to that mindset. And when you do, it'll, your life will blossom. You will benefit. And I'll tell you this, you might just build a wall that would have took years and 52 days. The choice is yours. The choice is mine. I don't want to waste my days on this earth. So few as they are, we're all here for a short time. Why waste it? Why take the long road? Why take the years when we could do it in days? Let's bow our heads and pray. Perhaps uh, you came this morning and, uh, you know, maybe your mind was somewhere else. But God spoke to your heart. You know, the choice is yours this morning. And uh, I know when it's time to buckle down and get things done, you got to sell yourself out and have the right kind of state of mind. And we got so many things in this world, you know, especially here in America. You know, we're always being drawn away from the most important things in life. Hey, why don't you do whatever it takes this morning to get that relationship back with God. To receive the word with readiness of mind. To serve the Lord with all humility. To love of mind. To love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, soul, and mind. You know, that's what life's about. That's what will make the difference, and, uh, and I think that's what will make us better people for Christ's sake. Let's bow our heads and pray. Father, we thank you for the day that you've given us today. We ask that you'll guide and direct our steps in this time of invitation. We ask that you'll uh, help us to get more disciplined to where we can have a better state of mind, one that's more beneficial for our lives. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.